director, Centre for Geographic Information Sciences and Technology, Rochester Institute of Technology, USA. Uh, he is going to talk about talk on COVID-19 natural disasters and mapping. So, Dr. Barian, over to you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Good. Okay. Let's see. Can you yeah. can you see my presentation okay? Yeah. Panopathy, do you see my presentation? Is it in full screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Tomaszewski. Um, I'm from the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, USA. I'm also affiliated faculty with the Valor Institute of Technology um, Center for Disaster Management. And I'm even lucky enough to have a custom Ganapathe uh, picture of myself. So I'm very honored by that. And I thank you for inviting me to be a keynote speaker. And um, my topic is not necessarily about early warning systems, but I thought the topic would be very relevant for what's happening in the world today. So uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about COVID-19, natural disasters and mapping. Um, really quickly, a little about me. My area of interest is geographic information science and technology, or quickly uh, G GIS is more commonly known. So here are the things I'm gonna talk to you about. Um, this is a short presentation of about 15 minutes. Um, first, I'll go over COVID-19. Um, I think we all have been affected by that in some way. But then I'll also kind of talk about natural disasters. And the third point, COVID-19 and natural disasters, which I think we're starting to see more attention of the challenges that are going to come with the combination of these two things. And then hopefully the ideas I'll give you in the fourth point, COVID-19, natural disasters and mapping, how can we really start to look at the spatial problems created by the combination of COVID-19 and natural disasters, which I think mapping in itself is its own form of early warning as we try to prepare for things as they start to come. And I'll give you some final conclusions to take away once I'm done. So real briefly, COVID-19. I took this as a screenshot I took yesterday when I was preparing this presentation if you've never seen this before, this is the very famous John Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard. Um, if you've never seen this, it's pretty intuitive. The main interface shows a map of the world of COVID cases um, around the world. They're, they're saying there's almost, uh, almost up to 12 million cases now of COVID-19 that have been confirmed. My country, the U.S., unfortunately has almost 3 million if you look at the map, it's nothing but red because of all the cases. And unfortunately for our hosts in VIT, India is, is slowly um, climbing uh, as in terms of the number of cases. So as we all know, this is a very serious problem. It's really the whole reason why we're even having a completely virtual conference, right? We can't all get together because of possible spread, travel issues, and so forth. So this is a real issue um, we're all dealing with, and, it, and I, in my opinion, it may take several years, not months, to really try to return to some form of a normal life and so forth. However, while COVID-19 has been going on, we can't forget that the world is coping with natural disasters. This is a picture from the United States from 2019 showing billion dollar weather events. So billions of dollars. These are massive, gigantic natural disasters that happen that are very costly. Um, some of them you may be familiar with like Hurricane Dorian, um, California wildfires. Again, this is from my country, but we are seeing these kinds of problems all over the world. This is certainly not just a thing for the United States. I just use this graphic because I think it helps illustrate the point very well about what's happening with natural disasters. And I'm sure whatever country you're from, you can relate to problems related to natural disasters in your country. Okay, so thinking about this now, COVID-19 and natural disasters. 
So basically, you're looking at a situation of coupled disasters, right? You have COVID-19 happening while you have seasonal trends with hurricanes, the recurring threat of earthquakes, wildfires, and things that are always going to be happening because of natural systems on the earth, okay? So on top of that, you have limited resources and systems that have, have been very strained. If you think about developing countries that already had weakened health systems, that have a, a limited culture of disaster resilience and so forth, you have that existing situation and then you throw COVID-19 on top of all of that. So that's really the crux of this problem. Another big problem you have is we've all heard about social distancing right so people often during natural disasters are displaced um last year i had the privilege of spending some time in india and i got to visit the state of kerala where they have been having problems with flooding uh, more so recently in recent years and i was very i'm very interested in my research of the idea of displacement forced displacement and when you have people that have to be displaced because of a hurricane again an earthquake or any kind of natural disaster how do you handle that problem when you have to keep people socially distanced because of a global viral pandemic that's happening and so forth. So these, I think, are some of the, at least the three top issues. Now, this is a slide from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. They're sort of the national agency that um, handles things related to diseases and so forth. And they are now starting to publish because in America, we are heading into the hurricane season, um, a web page about, as it says, natural disasters, severe weather and COVID-19. And it outlines some of the issues that I already previously mentioned, preparing for hurricanes and COVID, public disaster shelters, professional workers and so forth. Again, all affected because of the pandemic, social spacing. And I even found this article. Um, these are actually, this is a picture of healthcare workers in Mumbai in India who are responding to COVID, but are also dealing with monsoons, hurricanes, tropical storms, and so forth. And again, the challenge here is you have complicated emergencies, disasters, and so forth. So you have to handle an emergency response again, while you're also dealing with the containment of the outbreak. And how does that impact the health service? How do people who work in the healthcare industry have to take care of COVID patients while also dealing with um, survivors or victims of natural disasters, impacts on the water supply, and again, just overall strain on the systems that in some cases may have already been strained before COVID. You also have this case of natural, multiple layers of natural disasters. Um, even in America, we're still trying to recover from say Hurricane Katrina that happened in 2017. Um, I've done some work in Texas where, that's, where that happened and they're still, they've made a lot of progress, but rebuilding environments that have been damaged and then another disaster comes and then COVID comes and so forth. Um, it just creates a lot of, of strain. And so this was also some guidance from the Center for Disease Control about the idea of displacement. So how do you, if you have to move lots of people because of their displaced, because from anything they could there could be floods that make them have to move out of their houses or leave their towns or whatever they have to go live in a shelter but how do you maintain the social distance because of course you don't want to create a compounded effect of having to leave because of a natural disaster and then creating an outbreak of COVID-19 inside of a shared space how do you handle extra supplies that you're going to need. Um, we all talk about um, having to use hand sanitizer all the time, wearing masks and so forth. I mean, these are real issues in terms of resources, logistics and so forth. And these are some pictures from some of my research just to think about some of these topics. Um, this top picture where it says where to go if already displaced, 
This is a picture of a refugee camp in Rwanda. These are people from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So if you have people that are already displaced, <coughs> excuse me, where do you send them? Where do they go if they're already living in shelters? And you can see by this picture, they're already living in very close quarters. Um, this is a topic that I'm very interested in doing more research on the possibility of the spread of COVID inside of refugee or displacement camps. Um, those are areas that reiterate points I've already made about strained resources and so forth. International humanitarian funding is, is, is um, in a very challenging time right now and adding COVID again on top of it. With natural disasters, the damaged infrastructure, how do you deal with taking care of people that have been impacted by a natural disaster, but then the infrastructure has been damaged. So where do you, where do you shelter them and take care of them? And there's always the issue of vulnerable groups. Um, this is a picture of young females um, from the Zatri refugee camp in Jordan, where I also do a lot of work and they are already vulnerable to the impacts of natural disasters. And then again, you add COVID on top of it. And as I'll just, I'll mention in just a moment, in sense, understanding where vulnerable groups are located could be its own form of early warning. You need to know where these people are located to anticipate the impacts of a natural disaster, COVID, or the combined issues together. And so here, um, here's the points, you know, I want you to take away. Um, we have a very diverse group of people, a lot of wide ranging topics. Um, the key thing I want you to think of to take away, um, again, again, because I'm a geographer by training, these are all fundamentally spatial problems. COVID is a spatial problem. Natural disasters are spatial problems. They affect people that live in places that travel across time and space. And that's why geographic information systems or mapping as I'm calling it are fundamental. And with geographic information systems, you can identify spatial relationships patterns, processes, and so forth that you can use to hopefully identify or as per the theme of this, this conference, um, have early warnings to know to plan and prepare when these things happen. And here's more of a sort of abstract theoretical idea, the idea of critical spatial thinking. So taking the idea of critical thinking, but applying that to spatial ideas. And I'll explain that in my next slides. So here's some examples from my work that I've been doing. Um, this is a map of the county that I live in, in upstate New York, US, where I started to map out the locations of vulnerable populations in relation to COVID cases. So the legend is showing you where we have elderly populations, the darker the blue, the more elderly or older people live there, and the larger the red circle, the more COVID cases that have been reported within that particular spatial unit. It's called a zip code. And this is the kind of thing you can start to think about in terms of mapping to understand and identify where vulnerable populations live as its own form of early warning. And you need this kind of information for both natural disasters in general, as it's well documented that, you know, about the impacts of natural disasters on vulnerable populations but you also have to think about where they are in terms of COVID and the combined impacts of a natural disaster with COVID. And that can include everything, um, not, you know, populations, the other dots in here, the yellow circles are the locations of hospitals. The orange uh, dots as from the legend are retail stores where people can buy food and so forth. And you really start need to start thinking of th these things combined together. Okay, this idea of critical spatial thinking this is the idea where you want to challenge your assumptions about space. So it's the old saying, thinking outside the box, but spatially, right? So if there's a way that you've always done things in terms of emergency management, in terms of planning, early warning systems, even challenge your own way of doing things and think about other ways you might go about it, assumptions you're making, limitations and so forth. That's basically the idea of critical thinking, which in academia, we teach our students to do that when we form an argument about something on a topic, but we take that idea to spatial. As one example, um, this is not my own idea. Um, I, I learned about this 
um, from the United States in terms of how people are going to handle sheltering and social distancing. Um, this is an old map I created on the left of your screen that shows the locations of traditional disaster shelters, right? These are places that have been established ahead of time that would be used for people during a natural disaster. However, critical spatial thinking might say, well, what about hotels? You need to keep people spatially distanced for social distancing. And I found this map showing how hotels, hotel occupancy has been going down, right? As we all know, COVID has been impacting the travel industry around the world and the tourism sectors around the world are suffering. And basically you have a lot of hotels that are underutilized. So why not use underutilized hotels as places that you could use for disaster shelters in lieu of using traditional shelters in order to keep people, people socially distanced. And that's just one example, but again, trying to think outside the box of where things are located. And that's the idea of critical spatial thinking. Um, there was also this interesting article um, from June 2nd by Esri on the idea of um, mapping um, using spatial approaches to safely reopening. Um, and for example, mapping the trends of COVID, where are things happening so you can plan about reopening, creating maps for community resilience, understanding where, again, like I said, where vulnerable populations are located, even organizational resilience. Um, we've all been impacted in our universities, our government organizations with COVID, having to work at home, work virtually and so forth, understanding the impacts of COVID and how that in turn could relate to natural disasters, how many people are dying, how many people are in hospitals, the capacity of hospitals, understanding where hospitals have higher numbers of people in terms of you may have to move them because of a natural disaster, and just generally using maps to communicate. Um, it seems like a simple idea, but there still is a lot of work to be done on just using maps in general as graphical communication. And if you're not using maps, I encourage you to start doing that in your research. So um, thank you for your time. Just my conclusions here. So just think about how COVID and natural disasters are coupled and the more complex challenges that they create and how they're fundamentally spatial problems and hence why geographic information systems are more important than ever. And the idea of critical spatial thinking to challenge your own assumptions about these kinds of problems. Think about new creative ways and using maps and possible new ways to find new insights into your problems. And with that, I thank you for your time and um, I hope you have a great rest of your conference. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful speech.